Paul Bolsford here, one of the authors of the textbook that goes along with this series of videos. I'd like to introduce the concept of data models to you here and introduce the main coordinate systems we use. I'd also like to talk about the peculiarities of the spherical coordinate system because it's highly valuable, in fact, really key to what we do, but you can get into trouble if you don't respect the limitations of the system. So data models are how we conceptually view our collection of data that describe features. They sit somewhere between the real world and the data structures the computer stores. Here's an example. This is a three-dimensional rendering of buildings and a landscape that I might want to manipulate. And underneath that rendering is this triangulated irregular network. It's an example of a fairly specialized kind of data model. Now we'll talk about the two main kinds in the next video, but right now I just want to lay some preliminaries. So conceptually, this data model is a series of features, in this case polygons, with attributes associated with them that abstracts a minor portion of the real world, the, the portion of the real world that we're interested in for our particular analysis. And that data model is associated with a set of data structures and machine code that does the actual calculations when I ask to select some polygons or calculate areas or overlay polygons. So the models usually have a geographic part, a part here that is the coordinates that define, in this case, polygons, and then associated attribute data, usually a relationship between rows in a table and specific features. So it's this intermediate abstraction. Now there are many ways to skin a cat or many ways to draw our data model. Here is a portion of southeast Salt Lake City with the urban developing area on the left and the wildlands on the right. And Google's data model for navigation in this area is a set of connected roads that are basically linear features with points associated with locations along those roads. When you ask it to navigate, it goes into a model that has geography, that is coordinates for these roads, and attributes associated with them, how fast you can drive on the road, whether you can make a left or right turn at a particular intersection. So our model is a subtraction where the real world in all its messiness gets converted to geographic features and tables associated with them. And for this piece of ground, there may be many data models one might abstract, one that includes elevation data, if I'm interested in hiking or locating solar panels, one that includes land cover data, I'm interested in planning or emergency response, one that includes just the building footprints and number of inhabitants in those buildings or the square foot value or some other thing of interest to a person for the value of taxation. So I have the real world, then I have various ways I can represent that real world visualizing the features that exist. And those will change depending upon my interests and the uses for which I'm going to apply them. Now we usually use Cartesian coordinates for the coordinate part of our data model. Cartesian coordinates, you know from geometry and algebra in previous courses, that you have two right angle or three right angle axes. They intersect at right angles, 90 degrees to each other. And the distances are uniform. So 10 units in the x direction or in the y direction are the same anywhere over our whole space. So they will very well behave. These axes are at right angles to each other and then parallel lines never intersect anywhere. They just keep going on ad infinitum. And we'll have in this Cartesian coordinate system maybe several different layers, thematic layers, each with an associated data model. Roads might be linear features where I have coordinates and then a set of attributes associated with the road type or condition or maximum speed. Soils might be a set of polygons all the way through with attributes associated with those polygons. Same thing for wetlands. There's no, if I have polygon wetlands, line features in the wetlands, the model basically says you have these attributes for each wetland and each wetland is a polygon. Elevation might be a different data model. And so we'll talk about the various kinds we often apply. And if we want to do analysis on a particular location, we have the coordinate saved. So we can go and find the coordinates for that location and overlay them or combine them to do our analysis.
Now, the world is not flat. The world is a sphere. So we have to have a way, an alternative way, to identify locations on this complexly curved surface that wraps back on itself. And so we use these spherical coordinates, and you should be very familiar with them. You have gone through them a bunch of times, so I'm just going to go through them quickly. All right? We have our longitudes, our lines of equal longitude, the head, north, south, and longitude changes as you move to the east or the west. There's a zero value at the Greenwich meridian, and then the longitudes increase, decrease negatively as you head west, and positively as you head east. Over here in the Pacific, at plus 180, minus 180, they intersect, and you get a discontinuity. Same thing at the equator. The latitudes start at zero and go zero to 90 north, or zero to minus 90 south. These lines of equal longitude all converge at the poles. The lines of equal latitude that head east-west are approximately the same distance apart. So one key thing about the spherical system is that it's not like a Cartesian system. These lines of one of the axes converge and hit each other at the North Pole and at the South Pole. So that complicates their use for a lot of calculations of area, distance, direction, those sorts of things. So you got to be careful. We usually store our data in a Cartesian system. Sometimes we store data in a spherical geographic system, but we usually don't want to do most calculations in the spherical system. We usually want to convert to a Cartesian system because of the distortion. Latitudes and longitudes have this other quirk in that we don't have a decimal system. It's 0 to 360 around the full globe, and then there are 60 minutes in each degree and 60 seconds in each minute. So there's 3,600 base units. Each degree is 3,600 seconds. And we can display what we call decimal degrees. So regular degrees would be have a degrees, minute, and second part. Decimal degrees have the degree and then point and whatever the decimal part is. We can convert between those by dividing the degrees, minutes, seconds by 60 and then 60 again. The book has an example for you if you want to um, go through it. But the main point is that even if we have these expressed as decimal degrees, they're still not a Cartesian system. Five degrees radius doesn't give you a circle. A circle in spherical coordinates is actually an oval when you get up near the pole or down near the South Pole. It, it's distorted because five degrees in an east-west direction changes as these lines converge. So if you plot on a flat map, you can get what look like circles, but the distortion is still there just in the underlying features. Antarctica gets incredibly uh, splayed out and distorted. So the spherical system is inherently distorted. You almost never want to do calculations in it. Sometimes you get information reported to you in a spherical system. For example, you can have a GPS that gives you a location in degrees, minutes, seconds, and decimal seconds. So it might be 1.1073 seconds. Well, what is that 0 0.073? What does that third or fourth decimal plate in seconds mean on the surface of the Earth in terms of a distance? And you can do an approximation. You can take the angle that you're talking about, in this case, a thousandth of a second, and multiply it by the radius. In this case, it would be the radius from the center of the Earth out to you on the surface of the Earth to give you an idea of what the distance is, what's the accuracy of your, your or the resolution of your reported data. So it's an approximation. It's going to be less accurate the further you away from the you are from the equator, but it gives you an estimate. Another thing you have to be careful about is in a lot of calculators in Excel and other spreadsheets. The radian measure is used for angles, not degree measure. Right? We wouldn't use 30 degrees or 90 degrees for an angle, and the radian measure would be using a number like 0.707 or 0.035, with a conversion of one radian is 57.2957 degrees. Again, there's an example in the book showing the calculation, but just know that's a pitfall. A lot of calculations in spherical systems the calculator assumes you're going to use radians. If you put in degrees, it'll give you a number, it'll give you an answer, but it'll be the wrong one. If we really want to do distances right, a better approximation is using a great circle distance on a sphere. 
And that's a more messy equation that involves the longitude difference and the latitude difference and the two longitudes of locations to find the actual distance between the shortest distance between two points A and B. So I have to enter this kind of messy equation. And actually, there's several different versions that approximate it. And the measurement is along a great circle, which is always the shortest distance between two points on a sphere. Now, a great circle connects the two points and the center of the Earth in a plane. They're all three in the same plane. Any other circle that splits through the Earth is not a great circle, and it gives you a longer distance. Now, we usually don't look at things on a sphere. We look at them on a flat map plotted in a Cartesian map. So if you're on a plane and you see, oh, I'm flying from point A to point B, in this case, Seattle to Paris, what's my route? You think, we're going way out of our way. But in fact, no, that's the shortest distance. That's the great circle distance. It's distorted because of that latitude-longitude distortion when we plot it on the flat screen on the back of the seat in front of you. So this is actually the shortest great circle distance going over most of northern Canada and, and Greenland. And so you sometimes are fooled by the distortion of the coordinate system into thinking this isn't the best measure, but it is. It's the shortest distance. It even gets more complicated because the Earth isn't actually a sphere. This calculation gets much more complicated because the Earth is flattened. The poles are pulled in and the equator bulges out due to the centrifugal spin of the Earth. So this distance B is less than this distance A, this semi-major axis, is bigger than the semi-minor axis. And so although I said that the longitudes really get distorted as you get north and latitudes not so much, they still do because remember in this equation, D equals R theta. For a given theta, let's say moving one degree, if R is smaller, D has got to be smaller. And remember here, B is smaller than A, so a degree spans a shorter distance up here because the theta of one degree times B is the radius. It gives me a smaller number than the theta of one degree times A. So you get distortion in both directions on this spherical system. Finally, we don't have anything to do with magnetic north except knowing where it is. All of our references in the spherical system were to the geographic north and south poles, not the magnetic north and south poles. They wander around. They're hard to locate. A lot of reasons we don't use them. For route finding, sure, you might with a compass, a magnetic compass, but anymore you're just using the GPS. So given these issues, we store most of our data in a Cartesian system. Some we store in a latitude and longitude spherical system, but we always or almost always want to convert into a Cartesian system, either explicitly or implicitly, before we do any calculations. Remember, again, data models are these intermediate abstractions. We can abstract into many different data models for the same area, sometimes for different themes, but even different data models for the same thing. That's where to think about the data in terms of their geography or a set of coordinates and their main attributes. We primarily use Cartesian coordinates to store our data because they're better behaved than spherical coordinates. We measure on the surface in spherical coordinates. We convert those to Cartesian often before storing the data, but always or almost always before doing our analysis.